The first question I'd like to ask you, Salim, is what is the Climate Vulnerable Forum? The Climate Vulnerable Forum is a group of uh, vulnerable countries uh, drawn from the main uh, groups within the UNFCC, which are the small island developing states, the least developed countries in Africa. And it was convened two years ago by President Nasheed of the Maldives in the run-up to Copenhagen to get leaders from these countries to engage on this issue and to have their voices at the more leadership global level rather than just a, a negotiations level. It's not a new negotiating bloc. It's just a, a coalition of countries that uh, want to take action, want to go ahead and do something rather than just keep on talking about it. Uh, the forum then met again uh, in Kiribati, uh, hosted by President Tong of Kiribati the following year, last year. And this is now the third meeting that Bangladesh is hosting. It's grown to nearly 30 countries now uh, from Asia, Africa, Latin America. And it's being represented here by ministers and uh, senior officials from these countries. And the idea in this particular meeting is for these countries to come together uh, and proclaim that they are not uh, willing to or they are not uh, uh, waiting for action at the global level or, or agreement at the global level. They're going to go ahead and do things. And indeed, many of them are already doing things. Uh, Bangladesh, for example, has set up a climate change strategy and action plan. It has resourced that plan with about $300 million of its own money and is implementing it. So it's not waiting for the world to come and rescue it. It's going to help itself. And many of the other countries are doing something similar. Being vulnerable countries, the primary emphasis is obviously on adaptation to climate change, but that doesn't mean that they're not doing mitigation as well, and they're quite willing to do mitigation. Uh, one very good example of that is President Nasheed's uh, promise to become carbon neutral, make the Car Maldives carbon neutral by 2020, which is a big ask given that they are dependent on fossil fuels uh, like diesel for their electricity generation, but he's doing a lot of work on that dimension. The argument from these countries is that even if their emissions are small, they still will do whatever they can to reduce them because every little bit counts and because it's the right thing to do, not because they're being forced to do it. In fact, in the UNFCC negotiations, quite often these countries are exempted from ha having to take mitigation actions because they're poor and vulnerable. But these countries are saying we don't need an exemption. We want everybody to do it and we are quite willing to do our bit. And they want to lead by example. So the idea is that this particular grouping of countries might become a, a moral leader, if you like, on the issue of climate change, not waiting for global agreements to occur in Durban or uh, in the COPs, but taking action at home. And part of the, the uh, meeting here is sharing those actions with each other, learning from each other, um, building up on, on what we are doing in each of the countries. Uh, again, another good example is the fact that Bangladesh has set up a a multi-donor uh, climate change trust fund, which is now something that is becoming something of a model for many other developing countries who are thinking along the same time, same lines, and some indeed have moved ahead on those lines. So there's a lot of learning and sharing that can take place, which is taking place. And the, the whole ethos is not sitting and waiting for a global agreement, but just going ahead and doing things, being vulnerable countries, um, appealing to others to take action as well particularly the large emitting countries, both the rich emitting countries and the large developing uh, countries to take action as well, uh, but not forcing them and not accusing them, but just appealing to them uh, to do the right thing. And do you think those appeals are being heard? Do you see rich countries moving towards taking action? Yes and no. Um, certainly a lot of action is taking place in, in uh, different countries, uh, particularly in the large developing countries. Countries like China and India are definitely doing a lot. Uh, one must give them that. But collectively, we're not doing enough, and everybody recognizes that. So we need to up our ante and up our game in terms of doing more. Um, my sense is that there is probably a, an appetite amongst certain people in these countries, and to a large extent, the appeal is not so much to the leaders who haven't uh, done what they were supposed to do, but to the citizens of these countries, to tell them that the poor countries are actually taking the lead on this, and your countries. Uh, should be doing the same and hopefully maybe shaming them into taking action. Um, there hasn't been a, a, a positive result that I can point to yet, but uh, we're not giving up. And how do you see the international dimension of this playing out within the UN? We've got important UN talks coming up in Durban later this month. How, how are the international negotiations on climate change going to move forward? Well, one of the reasons for setting up this forum and continuing with it 
is the recognition that the international negotiations are not making progress. Since the debacle of Copenhagen, uh, where we had high ambitions which were shattered and didn't happen, we have uh, defaulted into a game of very low expectations. In Cancun, it was described as a success simply because it wasn't a failure. Uh, and we're going into Durban with similar sorts of realization that there's not going to be no breakthrough given the political situation in the United States of America. President Obama and his negotiating team could not pass anything in Congress that they agreed to in, in Durban, and everybody knows it, so nobody's going to deal with them. Because even if the rest of the world were to give in to everything the U.S. negotiators asked for, when they went back to Washington, they wouldn't get it through Congress because they don't control Congress, and everybody knows that. So the U.S. is out of the game. Now, the rest of the world may go ahead and do things. Uh, hopefully, there will be a coalition of the willing that will carry on. On the legally binding agreement and on uh, mitigation targets, there's hardly anybody who expects uh, an outcome. On adaptation and funding, we have higher hopes. Uh, there's good uh, progress on adaptation, mainly because nobody disagrees that there shouldn't be adaptation. It's a sort of motherhood and apple pie issue that everybody can agree on. What the differences are on how much money and how to flow the money for it, and how to do it and who does it and, and so on. So they're more operational uh, negotiations on the how rather than whether or not it should happen. And then the, the Green Climate Fund that will um, manage the 100 billion a year that has been promised from 2020 onwards is really the big thing uh, up for negotiations that we hopefully will get a result on. But on the really big things in terms of the ambition, the mitigation targets and the le legally binding, nobody expects an outcome in Durban. What do you think are going to be the, the sticking points in Durban? You've said nobody expects an outcome. What's causing the gridlock? The gridlock is, as I said, the United States of America is simply not going to play ball. And the, given the political situation domestically in the US with the Republican Party and indeed the Tea Party of the Republican Party uh, in the ascendancy, the White House has no leverage at all, even if they wanted to do things. And I believe they want to do things, but they can't. And everybody knows that. So if the US is not willing to do things, then other large countries like China, India, Brazil are unlikely to do, although the, everybody's doing voluntarily things. So that's the, the default, is everybody does voluntary targets, or NAMAs as they're termed, nationally appropriate mitigation actions, which they've all put on the table. But when you add them all up, we are headed for four degrees, not two degrees. If we want to get to two degrees, then they're going to have to ratchet those up considerably. And simply doing voluntary action is not going to do it. So the political environment in the US isn't conducive to action, but how can we move the agenda forward? What's it going to take? Well, I'll give you my personal opinion, and it's just, you know, my crystal ball as good as anybody else's. Uh, um, I think the following. I think we are in a strategic retreat at the moment. The tide is against us to get good action at the global level. This won't last forever. It'll last for a while, and we'll come out of it at the other end um, in a few years' time. The the science of climate change convinces everybody but the US. So we don't need more science because the US doesn't believe the science, or by and large citizens and by and large their Senate and their Republican Party. So science isn't going to convince them. Um, what will convince them, in my view, is a sort of uh, notion that is growing within the US of uh, potential rivalry with the next superpower being China. And the moment they realize that China is actually going ahead and is going to beat them to the post-fossil fuel era with the post-fossil fuel technologies that China is investing heavily in and, and ramping up its ability to uh, develop, then the U.S. Will, will turn. And that will cause them to change their attitude and, and do things. They're not going to do it because the rest of the world is suffering. They're not going to do it because of the science they've demonstrated those things are not effective. Uh, but they might do it. it, it's what one might call the Sputnik moment, you know, when they, the Russians put the Sputnik up and then the US started NASA and the space race and put a man on the moon in 10 years time with a huge investment of knowledge and technology and money. That will happen when they have the similar uh, thinking or the moment when they, they twig that China is actually going to beat them to this post-fossil fuel era and that they, being the richest and technologically most advanced country, are going to be left behind. And then they'll turn around and they'll do it for that reason, not for any other reason.
If it's a, a self-interested um, reasoning which is going to motivate political action from the, the superpowers, where does this moral leadership from, from the poorer, most vulnerable countries come into it? The moral leadership comes appeals, I think, to the younger generation, even in the US. Um, interestingly, I gave an interview just less than, uh, just over 24 hours ago on 350.org, this um, uh, web-based group that a lot of uh, young people it was created in the US, but there are young people around the world who, who follow it and do stuff. And even in the last 24 hours, the number of postings that I've had there, positive postings from young Americans saying, you know, we are all with you. We, are, we, we believe that this is right and we want to follow your lead. So it isn't a, a totally bad situation, but it is difficult. You know, the leaders aren't convinced. Uh, hopefully the next generation of, of citizens and leaders uh, will respond. I think the rest of the world is, is well on the way to responding. In Europe, we don't have to make this case. In the rest of the world, everybody knows this. They, they, their response is more sort of, you know, we're in hard times now, so it's difficult for us to do this. We know it's the right thing to do. They don't question that. In the US, they're still questioning whether it's the right thing to do or not. Is US action going to come fast enough to tackle climate change? The answer is no. Um, actions have um, not come anywhere near uh, quickly enough uh, to tackle climate change. We are going to be having some level of climate change that is now unavoidable and inevitable. The temperature rise over the last century has been 0.8 degrees centigrade. We're locked into probably another 0.7 degrees, so that's a one and a half degree temperature rise, which means very large numbers of poor people in poor countries are going to be affected quite badly. That's inevitable, that's going to happen. Um, we can still prevent catastrophic climate change of three degrees or four degrees temperature rise, which we're headed towards, but we don't have to reach if we take action. And that, if that happens, then it's not just poor countries that need to worry, it's rich countries as well. And then they perhaps will take the action in the next few years. So we need, it, it's like turning a big oil tanker around, it takes time, we need a few years to do that. As long as they come on board in the next few years, then it, it's possible. Perhaps in a second Obama term, uh, we might think about it, but uh, don't hold your breath. And we've got the UN negotiations coming up this month. What comes next? What, what should we look out for in 2012 as opportunities to more move the, the, the climate agenda forward? Well, I would say two things. Firstly, the UN talks are no longer the only game in town. I would say, in fact, they are actually not the most important game in town. Uh, the most important game is not the one in one town, but in many, many towns that's taking place all over the world. There are actions taking place at the local level, by communities, by cities, by nation states by many different actors, private sector, um, and these are where the action is. This is where the solutions to the problem are occurring and the Climate Vulnerable Forum is a very good example of a country, a group of countries of forming a coalition of the willing to act, as it were, on this issue. All of them are acting and, ta and taking actions, not waiting for agreements to do that. So the action has moved away from the agreement, uh, reaching an agreement to doing it on the ground. Now, we accept that that's not going to be enough, that has to be ramped up considerably, and an agreement would help us achieve that, but the agreement, uh, the COPs are not necessarily, uh, even the next one after Durban, likely to be the, the places where we make these agreements. There will be another gathering in 2012 in June at the 20th anniversary of the Earth Summit in 1992, Rio plus 20 it's called, where countries will again gather and take stock over what has happened over the last 20 years. Some good, not, some not so good. On the climate front, uh, as I said, we have had the Kyoto Protocol, we've had some actions, but they've not been um, big enough and fast enough, and we haven't been able to ramp them up. But there have been some actions, and hopefully countries, once they start taking actions, will find that it isn't that difficult to do, it isn't that expensive to do, and indeed it might be beneficial to do. So that's the kind of experience that is in fact happening in the, in the vulnerable countries. Once they start taking actions, they find out it's actually good for development. It's not bad for development. And just finally, in Bangladesh, what does the future look like 10, 20 years down the line? Well, Bangladesh is an <coughs> interesting mix of uh, good and bad, uh, positive and negative. It's 150 plus million people in a tiny area with a hugely dense population. On the other hand, it's a success story in terms of the last 30 years the population uh, growth rate coming down from somewhere near 3% to somewhere near under 2%, uh, unprecedented to be done anywhere peacefully without huge economic uh, uh, growth and development, uh, so in a Muslim society. So that's a major achievement. 
otherwise we would have had another 20 or 30 million people or babies in this uh, time period. We haven't had them. Um, we have fed the country. The growth, the growth in agriculture has kept pace with the growth in population. The country is roughly food self-sufficient. The farmers in this country and the agriculture scientists have been able to ramp up food production uh, in pace with population. We haven't had any famines since the 70s. Major achievement in its own right. Uh, and being a very vulnerable country to climate change, it has now been seized by this issue of climate change. There are very high levels of awareness from the prime minister down to the ministers to the government and the non-government sector. Um, you can't turn around in Dhaka without bumping into a climate change workshop going on, uh, organized by somebody here, which is good. Very high level of awareness, as I said. It's now in the process of converting that awareness into knowledge and practice and, and doing things about it and learning how to do those things because it's a new area, a new subject. Nobody's done this before. So it's going up a learning curve uh, collectively as a society, both within government and outside government. And the Climate Vulnerable Forum and its Bangladesh's chairmanship of it over the next year or so uh, will be another occasion for this uh, learning and sharing across other countries as well. Salim, thank you very much for speaking to us. You're